Good evening and welcome to the Scarborough Board of Education meeting. Today is Thursday, February 27th, 2014. May I please have the attendance? Mrs. Bealy? Here. Mr. Chiazzo? Mrs. Lang? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Murray? Here. Dagger? Here. Would you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dr. Entwistle, do we have any adjustments to the agenda this evening? Uh, there are none. Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to 5.0, our workshop session. And this evening we have a legislative update. Dr. Entwistle, I'll mm -hmm. leave the introductions to you. Sure. Um, the board uh, wished to invite uh, the local uh, legislators, and uh, we're happy tonight to have Senator Millette and to have uh, Representative Siraki with us. Uh, just so you all know, um, uh, Representative Siraki is in her second term. Is in her second term, um, and serves residents of uh, District 128, um, and uh, basically uh, s uh, her areas of interest are healthcare, education, challenges of small businesses and farmers, um, and we have um, Senator Millette who hails from um, a place that I'm a bit familiar with, Cape Elizabeth, <coughs> and she shares something with the board members, uh, school board members, in that she is a former school board member, and uh, Senator Millette serves on the Education and Cultural Affairs Committees. So, pleased to have you both here tonight, and we're anxious to hear uh, any information that you might have that would be helpful for us. Uh, we're in the midst, or the early s stages anyway, of uh, putting together our budget. Um, members of my team are here, not all of them, but many of them are here, and we've been hard at work, so um, I think anything that you could uh, give us in terms of uh, guidance and, uh, and or information would be greatly appreciated. Great. Thank you for having us here. Um, I would just say, um, not only do I serve on the Education Culture Affairs Committee, but I have the pleasure of being the co-chair of that committee um, in my first term. <laughs> so that was a bit of a surprise when I found that out. Um, but it's been an absolute joy being on that committee. Uh, it's, we are of all, very much of like minds, all members, and um, we have been tackling some pretty vexing problems. <laughs> in our committee and this this year and last year uh, we have been intermixing with our regular legislative work and analysis of the essential programs and services funding formula um, but I know that's not necessarily what you first want to hear about I know that you're interested about the budget <coughs> and, and, and what may be happening on that the, um, the biennial budget uh, uh, well, we have a constitutional requirement to balance the budget and every, so we have, we passed a biennial budget last year and then normal procedure <coughs> is in the second year you have a supplemental <coughs> budget just to make sure everything is balanced. Um, part of the biennial budget was a requirement that the Office of Policy and Management find savings um, and there was a report, we call it the Rosen Report, and in that report there are a number of um, recommendations. Uh, the, the, the theory behind the um, task given to the Office of Policy and Management was to find efficiencies in state government. And um, I would say that on, on the education side and the cultural affairs side, uh, a lot of it actually feels more like a curtailment than it actually does in efficiencies. Um, there is a recommendation for a cut to general purpose aid of roughly $9 million. Um, under the auspices of finding new efficiencies within school administration and basically say, recommending that uh, for those districts that spend more than, uh, and I, was, I hate to, get, I think it's $220 per pupil on school administration, uh, they are curtailed to that amount. But there is also an um, a waiver sort of for small school districts 
Well, when you, when, when you, we actually take a look at the number of districts that are over that 220 and then you take out the small school districts, the number of schools that are impacted directly it becomes quite small and the impact is quite large. Um, I've been very clear with the members of the Appropriations and Financial Affairs Committee that policy-wise it is um, ill-advised to be asking our school districts to be making more cuts. It's not as if this would be the first round of cuts in administrative, but more cuts to administration given um, the high demands that the state of Maine is now making of its administrators. And, and two examples that I like to give them is the implementation of the proficiency-based standards and implementing comprehensive and robust teacher evaluation systems. Um, there's much more that I could add to that list, but those are two big doozies that uh, we all agree uh, across the state of Maine is very important. Uh, but that at the same breath to then say, but you must do it with less resources, uh, seems um, a tad illogical. Um, my, the Appropriations and Financial Affairs Committee made it clear that for policy committees to come forward and say, it's not, don't take our money and not offer any solutions is not helpful. So um, we have been looking at the casino revenues that are to flow to school districts. And right now there's a revi there's a forecasted, um, they forecasted more than was originally budgeted, about roughly four million in fiscal year, I can't remember the years, so how the 14 and then fiscal year, five million in fiscal year 15, which is roughly nine million dollars. And we said, go ahead, so, you know, keep the, keep the regular casino money that was was budgeted for this year, still flowing to the districts, but take that extra nine million and plug in that roads and curtailment of, of um, nine million dollars. So that was one of our recommended um, possible solutions for that aspect of, of, of the uh, budget. But there's a lot there's a lot more challenges out there than just the Rosen report. Um, which I'm still waiting to get a, a kind of a more in-depth look at, at what the supplemental budget looks like. But rest assured, as a school, former school board member, I am always very cognizant of the fact that right now is when everyone is doing their hard work and we need to try to be as clear um, in, 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 a, in a quick manner as to what will be coming the, the way the school districts and we'll continue to fight that fight. So Budget-wise, that's what I have to offer. Thank you. Are there any questions of Senator Miller? So where are we currently with the PICUS report? <laughs> are we, if, do we have the whole thing yet? Yes. And what are the implications for, what was it, forty four hundred and thirty thousand dollars Yeah, was well, right. The price tag was really up there. It's, it's yes, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, it has been delivered to us. There was a second revision. Originally, the, the report said the, it, it valued the cost of education in Maine as being roughly $350, $380 million more than what we're currently funding. And with its revised, um, numbers it was closest closer to, to 400 million dollars. So uh, the Education Committee has scheduled and we are probably more than midway through roughly 12 to 15 work sessions. Um, so that's 12 to 15 days worth of discussing the PICUS report <coughs> and its recommendations. We, it was, it's just so big that what we, we first did was to say, um, as a committee, what did we think the priorities were within that report in terms of changes that we think would be important to make to the way we fund education in the state of Maine? And what rose up out of that were, were early childhood education, ec uh, support for economically disadvantaged students, professional development, and then if we still have the stamina, comparable wage index, Discussions. So that's kind of how we've organized ourselves. We waded through early childhood education. We actually had a, a we, we had 
kind of two pathways to deal with early childhood education. We had the EPS model, the EB rec. Um, yeah, the EPS model and then the, what we call the evidence-based model or the EB model that was recommended by PICUS. And then we had an early childhood education bill. Um, we are trying to figure out a way to support um, getting more four-year-olds into our public schools and helping to kind of flesh out as many uh, resources to our families to, to get these kids into um, very positive healthy environments um, to and, and into kindergarten so by the time they get to first grade they're really ready to learn. The evidence is blaringly clear how important these early years are and I take every opportunity I can to come before the Health, Health and Human Services Committee to encourage them to invest in that side of early childhood because if this is done in partnership with them um, and so Head Start or um, child care providers, it's all kind of this matrix. And the more we can make sure that all of those um, options are of high quality, the better chances we have in our schools to, to raise performance and get ki more kids succeeding. Um, so so we're, we're working on funding and mandate issues around that. We're, we haven't quite landed on what that solution is, but we really do want to make that more robust within the public schools. We uh, have kind of touched on economically disadvantaged. We were hoping to get a little bit more guidance from the Department of Education itself on what it thought were some of the more <coughs> impactful ways to address it. Um, they're feeling a bit overwhelmed by that task, so we're, we're <laughs> trying to continue that conversation on our end. Um, one of the things that we're looking at are um, implementing more more mentors for students. So we're trying to figure out: do we want to still give the 0.15, the extra 15 percent per stu per economically disadvantaged student, or do we want to change it more to what the EB model, what PICUS recommended, which was some very specific things, including mentoring, extra intervention, after-school programs, summer school programs. Um, and, and of that of that nature, uh, we need to finish that conversation. Um, but we just, I think, wrapped up today the third conversation on professional development, which was um, basically focused on providing districts with opportunities. I think it's going to be to to work with the Department of Education to choose from a, a menu of ways of, of strengthening professional development. So we, we, we recognize the importance of local control, but we also want to try to somehow maintain a level of quality across the state of Maine. So we don't necessarily want to tell Scarborough what to do, but we want to suggest that these are some of the best practices that can be used to help strengthen your professional development. And these areas would include things like, we have, and the names change, it's either instructional coaches, teacher leaders, master teachers of, of that ilk. Um, more collaboration time, you know, the discussion about, well, if you allow districts to hire more elective teachers, then you can open up um, the core teacher schedules to be able to meet consistently throughout the year because that's been shown um, through evidence that it's incredibly important. And then the last aspect was um, <coughs> adding more pupil-free days to, to the calendar. And, and making funds available to do that. Um, and we have not touched on comparable wage index. I think that's going to be the, probably the most challenging. And um, I don't know if we're going to land on an answer in a quick time frame, just because it takes a lot of data, which neither the department no, nor PICUS really had to give us an accurate picture of how you measure what comparable salaries are in the different regions in the state of Maine. So I, I can't really say what, what's going to happen with that. So, so all of this sounds really great, right? And, and that's all money. And how can we possibly do this in the current environment? And we recognize that. So what our hope is is that, and what we've been operating on is, we wanted to talk about what we thought was most important for education at the policy level. And we pushed aside the, the cost of it. 
we just wanted to all land on what we thought education should look like in the state of Maine and how we can support, support our schools. Then we're going to get into the discussion of, okay, what, you know, how much do these things cost and um, what sort of a time frame, timeline can we put in place with specific triggers to, to activate new investments into these various areas based on our priorities. So we don't want to just say to the districts, here, you need to do this and there's no new money. We recognize that's a non-starter. Um, so we would have to raise an additional 20 million or whatever it is um, to help fund the early childhood education programming. And, and at the same time, we need to continue to move the state towards 55%. If you can do that, then that helps reduce any potential for winners and losers when you change the EPS model. Because if, if any of you are aware, when you start tweaking with the 279 and you change ratios or, and, and the way things are targeted, you end up with winners and losers. And that's, a, that's the quickest way to get a bill stuck on the floor of, of our chambers. So, um, so that's kind of where we will go at the, at the next process. But the next step of this process. Jackie. I have a theory on the on the early childhood. First of all, it, it appears as though uh, both the federal and state government are unwilling or unable to put any money into it at the present time. Uh, but there are many communities like Scarborough who have very good preschools. And if, if we have uh, start educating in public schools, third, three and four year olds, two things are going to happen. One, we don't have the infrastructure at the present time to accommodate those children. And secondly, we will be removing tax paying businesses from our community who are now educating these children. So it seems to me that, that part of whatever we do should be looking at a partnership, uh, a public-private partnership that would perhaps we would hire somebody to oversee or to coordinate the, the curriculum piece with the existing preschools. Well, interestingly enough, current statute actually does allow for public schools to offer preschool programs to fourth graders. And there are public schools already in the state of Maine doing that. I understand. The language in the statute requires that this is done in partnership with community organizations or child care providers or Head Starts. So that's already in statute and that's the model we're working from. And I don't know how many are familiar with the Educare model, but that's kind of like our, our um, blue ribbon uh, approach to pre-K or um, preschool programming in public schools. Um, and while, yes, there are a number of really great preschools, private preschools out there, there are many families who can't afford um, those preschool programs. And we are trying to get more of those kids. In, and, and those preschool programs sometimes are not enough hours. Um, and we are trying to just kind of fill in. So this is not to replace. This is to fill in and make more robust. And I would say the good news on the federal level is that there actually is money available. Um, there's the, early, er, the challenge grants for early childhood education. Whether the state of Maine is going to apply for those, I don't know. Um, I certainly would hope so because it's a big pot of money. Um, and we certainly could use the help in getting us kick-started in that direction. Thank you. Now we'd like to turn it over then to Heather. Great, thank you for having me. And I'm really glad that Senator Millett was here because that is the Education Committee is one that I don't serve on. But I did bring you all summaries of the PICUS report. Um, <coughs> oh, great. They can pass us along. Is it? Uh, these like are short. This is a <laughs> short version yeah. because apparently yes. the full report's about 200 pages and it is available online at the main.gov. Uh, website um, of the policy and legal analysis book um, has, has a link there for you. And um, 
what I um, think might be helpful to understand is coming at it from the, the budget end that Senator Millett described a little bit. The biennial budget that the state of Maine passed last summer was balanced with some unidentified savings. And they haven't been identified yet. <laughs> so we're still out of balance and we're going to be working on a supplemental budget to try to fix those holes in the budget. And they are, um, it's increasingly difficult because I serve on the Health and Human Services Committee and the Medicaid portion of the budget is what it is cannibalizing the budget. It's about 25% of the budget now, which has doubled in about 10 years, and we expect it to be about 40% of the budget in the next 10 years. That's without expanding. So it's a tremendous chunk of the budget. So my advice to everyone is to hope for the best, but plan for the worst. And uh, I think it's we're trying to find efficiencies at all levels and we have tremendous needs that are not being met, not just unable to provide the funding that we would like to for education, for instance, but we have these tremendous wait lists. And a lot of school departments have very robust services for, for instance, the autistic population, which has just exploded. And about 1 in 88 now is the average. Um, are in that category. <coughs> so if you just look at statistics, we have about um, 160 individuals entering the wait list once they come off the public school system, enter the adult system, and they enter a wait list. And we had been, um, the state of Maine had institutionalized a lot of individuals, and with our consent decree, when we went um, back to more of a community-based type system. The, the requirement was that individuals would receive those services close to home. And we have not kept up our part of the bargain. I mean, we have really by law, we should be uh, addressing the needs of these individuals and it's very expensive. To eliminate the wait list right now would be an additional 50 million a year and those numbers just keep growing every year. So we have a lot of um, fiscal challenges. I can pass up some of this information here. We have um, billions of dollars unfunded liabilities that we do not have a revenue stream for. You can take a look at these. Um, that being said, I also brought along um, a document showing our total state expenditures and what I would like you to look at is years 2011 and 2012 and you will look at a category called federal funds and you'll, you'll see that we've had a drop, a significant drop in the amount of federal funds we're receiving and this is the ERA money, the stimulus money, the American Recovery Act money. That has um, really put a crunch on us. So even though we are flat funding at about 0.8%, less than 1% growth in the Department of Health and Human Services, even with that flat funding, we're hundreds of millions of dollars short per year due to the cuts in the federal funds, which means that the general funds portion of our budget has grown dramatically, um, which puts a squeeze on municipalities because as we get less money from the feds, then the state has less money to share. Um, so I think, you, I think we all know that Maine has some demographics that are really concerning. It does the whole country. We are the grayest country, I mean, grayest state, <laughs> oldest state in the nation. And in the last four years, two of the last four years, we've actually lost population. And so, uh, but I say we don't have too many old people, we just don't have enough young people. We need more young people, we need to grow jobs, we need to grow the economy, a vibrant economy with more jobs is really the answer. So our focus is also trying to, 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 to address that and try to keep our young people here and, and have them working. And 
One bit of good news is we do have unemployment down to 6.2 percent, which is good. Um, it's, a, it's definitely um, going in the right direction, but um, need a little more economic growth to really address all of these really significant um, issues that we have. The, um, um, one of the big issues we're dealing with in my committee is, of course, Medicaid expansion. And I did bring along these documents here just so you can have an idea of what the, the estimated costs will be with that. And if that happens, um, we will have some some more stress on the general fund. Um, and we um, hear a lot as one solution is to reverse the tax cut that was enacted a couple of years ago. And that tax cut was uh, a tax cut of 8.5% down to 7.95. So it's about a half of a percent. It's not a huge tax cut, um, but it did take 70,000 of our poor meaners completely off tax rules so it helps them get their feet under them and hopefully climb out of poverty a little easier. And the, um, the interesting thing with the tax cut is we're ahead of revenue projection with the tax cut. So um, thinking that putting the tax cut back in is going to solve our problems, all that does is put the brakes back on the economy that we're trying to grow. So we feel Many of us feel that's definitely the wrong direction to go. So what we're trying to do is grow the economy so that we can have more revenue, so that we can help this, this will all become a little easier. But this is sort of a, a transition period as we try to grow that economy. I think um, at the federal level and at the state level, everyone's very concerned about the economy, trying to jumpstart it and get, get it going. And it seems to be moving in the right direction, just slowly. So, if I may. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, I, I don't want to take up a lot of the school board's time because um, I know you have important work to do on the budget. And I, I didn't come prepared to, to kind of argue ideal ideologies, um, but given um, Representative Siraki's comments, um, I feel like I just need to say that uh, as far as I'm aware, nobody is talking about uh, eliminating the tax cut um, to, to balance <coughs> the budget. Um, but I would dispute her claims about the import, in, the import to the lower um, and middle classes uh, benefits from that tax cut and would say that, you know, on average there was $2,700 tax cut to the top 1% and it was about $70 for those below that. So um, I would disagree with that, characteriz disagree with that characterization. And, um, Again, I'll, I'll just wrap up with saying that I, I, I have a hard time with kind of setting up this confrontational relationship between education, health, and human services. Um, and for, for, for those of us who deal with the question of how can we help our children succeed in school, um, I, it is a complex, multi-layered question and challenge. And to say that it to solely depends on what happens in the classroom is unrealistic and unfair to our teachers and our administrators. We are all very aware of what the impact of the home environment and the community environment can have on a child's performance. And so if, there are, if that child's family is struggling, for either for economic reasons or mental health reasons or substance abuse reasons or um, marital status, uh, et cetera, it's very important <coughs> that we as a society have something in place to make sure that those environments remain um, healthy and, and um, consistent and safe so those children can relax and go to school ready and excited to <coughs> learn and engage. So um, while I do recognize that, that our resources are tight, I could no, no more recommend cutting um, things like TANF or substance abuse services or um, job assistance services, knowing full well that there are unintended consequences that can have an impact on the kiddos that we are trying to help um, make their way to be those future economic drivers for the state of Maine. So um, I'm hopeful that uh, as a legislature we can look at these challenge holes holistically and um, come to some, some more um, kind of friendly 
uh, resolutions rather than these, these kind of win-lose you know, win situations. So, thank you. And I would like to say, if I may, um, that I didn't mean to set up any sort of adversarial type of feeling. I'm just trying to lay out the financial overview of what we're looking at when we have to make these really difficult decisions. None of these are easy to say no or yes to. We have to, we have to prioritize our limited resources and that's what, that's what we do a lot of. And, um, and if I might, main revenue services um, indicated that the, the tax cut actually <coughs> resulted in about a $300 um, tax cut for the average Scarborough family that makes about $50,000 a year. I, you know, we appreciate the good job that the two of you are, are, are doing. <laughs> Uh, certainly on behalf of education, some of, some of what you are talking about, particularly when you're talking about the things that are important to the future workforce of Maine, um, uh, are very close to our hearts because uh, those are the things that really concern us the most. We, for example, uh, piloted a Jumpstart program. So when you think about a summer program with um, a limited very fairly limited investment. Part of that investment actually came from the collaboration that we have with four other school districts through our Sebago Education Alliance. Um, the investment that we were able to make um, will pay multiple levels of dividends as those kiddos who are just entering not school ready um, or would they would have entered not school ready entering school ready after about five or six weeks um, of a summer program. You know, th those are the creative kind of solutions that here on the ground um, we are, you know, we're spending time looking at because we're getting big bangs for the buck. And um, things like professional development, you, um, you basically, um, Rebecca, you basically um, laid out the plan here in Scarborough because that's, those are exactly the things that we are moving um, forward and, and they are having very positive um, effects. And, and interestingly, the one thing that you mentioned in terms of ensuring that there are enough um, uh, sort of uh, complementary uh, teachers to the, to the core academic programs is the very thing that we, we struggle with in terms of creating more time for our teachers. Um, and uh, and so, so I would say to you, those things are absolutely on the right track. And I, I saw my team members sort of going, oh, you know, we were like going, oh yeah, check, yep, yep, we're working on, yep, check, check, check. And then, and then that, that one piece, again, is, it comes down to a, a resource issue again. And, um, you know, we are trying as best we can at this level to do the problem solving. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, I appreciate the fact that uh, you all are, are, are engaged in problem solving um, and, Boy, it's tough business. Um, the, the economic uh, development piece. We are we're kicking off next week a um, a council of uh, business and 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 school partners, um, not only from uh, Scarborough, um, but from the greater Portland area. Many Scarborough, many have a base in Scarborough in terms of our business partners. So we're you know we're really trying to do as much as we can from the school perspective to contribute to that economic development because as educators we believe the biggest investment that you can make in terms of economic development is in education because what we fail to do now we will miss we will have years and years of missed opportunities in terms of not really preparing kids for the kinds of, of careers um, that we really likely will have here in Maine uh, we'd like to have more of them but the, the worst possible scenario is to have those careers and not have kids be career ready. So, um, you know, we've, we've all got, right. we've all got incredible amount of work uh, that we're engaged in. Um, it does take a toll after a while. Mm -hmm. We just all uh, had a little bit of a break in terms of school vacation, um, but we did a lot of shoveling during that period of time. So. <laughs> Exercise the body. Now you get Absolutely. to exercise your mind. Right, we're back to it again. <laughs> and I think Kevin. Well, Mike, can I just say kudos to Scarborough for reaching out to the business community and developing uh, partnerships in, in that aspect, and then also to the, the Sebago Alliance. Um, that's all 
the right stuff and should continue with, with or without state resources because it's with your fellow um, colleagues that you can start just having that dialogue about, well, this worked for us, this didn't work so well, so people aren't forced to kind of reinvent the wheel. I would say something that we struggle with on the Education Committee is um, like a realization that when, when we, in the, in, the, in the funding formula, give an extra 15% for economically disadvantaged students, we're not really sure how that money is being used. So when we ask the Department of Education, so, you know, how effective is that? They, because they actually have less, st less resources at the state level than they did 10 years ago. <clears throat> they don't have the capacity to follow up as rigorously as we would need them to. And so we kind of struggle with how much do we target and how much do we allow for local control. Um, and so that's a constant tension that we deal with because we want to be very respectful of, of the local understanding of what their communities need to do. Um, but with also kind of this thing about, well, we need to make sure our resources are being used effectively and efficiently, and how do we, how do we know that? Um, so hopefully we can continue to have that conversation at our level and encourage everybody here to kind of stay in touch with that discussion and shoot us. If you can't, it's hard to be up in Augusta, I know. So just email us. You can listen online. And I hate to say this, but sometimes we're even on TV. <laughs> um, <not laughs> um, but the, the, the MPBN has actually expanded its coverage of the work of the legislature. And so there are ways for you to kind of keep track of what we're doing and making sure that we're having the right discussion and asking the right questions. Kelly had something first, and then I'll come. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for coming. And I appreciate you bringing the information to us and the willingness to engage in the conversation and your job I do not envy you the task before you I just ask that when you go back to Augusta we're talking about the graining of the state and it is a serious problem and I think sometimes people think of it like a trivia fact about Maine hey do you know Maine's the oldest state but it's really more serious than I think a lot of people give it credit for <coughs> excuse me and you know you were talking about um, Representative Soraki about a way out of that is to increase um, business opportunities. Well, I just want you to think about when you're in Augusta and you're thinking of ways to solve this problem, when you're trying to attract young people to a state, if Maine gets a reputation for not investing in educating students that are here, we're not going to get those people to come and open a business or bring their families here and the same can be said for Scarborough. If we're not willing to invest locally in the schools, then people will think about leaving. And then IDEX and Unum and Maymed and all these wonderful companies we're so fortunate to have close by are not going to stay because they will not be able to attract the workforce they need because they need to inject young, energetic people who often come with families. So I just urge you to really keep in mind that it takes a long time to overcome a bad reputation. And especially for um, families, they're not willing to take a chance on their kids coming here. And if we don't have a um, solid reputation as a state that cares about kids and invests in education. So I, it's, I know that simplifies a problem that is way beyond um, one solution. But I just want that to be somewhere in the mindset while you're trying to figure it all out. So, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Go forward. And good luck. Jackie, <laughs> do you have to? And, and I too wish to thank you for coming and, and for responding when I have emailed and spoken with you. And uh, But there were two bills that, that are paramount right now that could cost us a lot of money um, as a community. I don't know how many children we have who might be attending the Baxter School for the Deaf, but there is a bill in the legislature now that is, is, will require communities to start paying for the interest infrastructure and start paying for the education and, and all of those things that have been part of the state's uh, budget because it has been a state and is a state school. That's number one. Number two is the virtual schools 
uh, I don't recall how many homeschool children we have at the present time in Scarborough, but uh, it could cost the town of Scarborough a lot of money going into uh, private companies. Uh, one thing if, if the state's running something and we contribute, it's quite another matter, I think, if, if a private concern is reaping benefits from the taxpayers of Scarborough and the state of Maine. So I just ask you to be cognizant of that because $9,000 a pop, isn't that what approximately $9,000 a student uh, is a lot of money, not only for Scarborough but for the state of Maine. So um, let's start with a tougher one, Baxter School. Um, the, we are feeling like this is a lose-lose situation as an education committee. The ultimate question r really ends up being who's responsible for FAPE. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking that what we need to do is put them in a room and let them fight it out. <laughs> I'm not sure as a committee how we're going to resolve that issue. Um, and there are passionate arguments on either side. So I, I certainly recognize that should, should the decision be that the state resides with the school district, what the financial consequences for that are. And we're, we would not be happy with it and we're not quite sure how to deal with that. At the same time, we recognize that what's been happening up to this point with Baxter School having its own line item within the education budget, they have not been receiving the kind of funding it needs to be able to adequately take care of all of the programming. And, and specifically, I think what really because the straw that broke the camel's back was the transportation costs. Um, so yeah, thank you for mentioning one of the, mo the, the toughest nuts that we've got um, coming before us. We just had the public hearing yesterday. And so uh, I think a week from to yesterday we will be starting the work session and I cannot even begin to tell you where we're going to fall on that. If anyone has, feel free to contact us with, with your first your, your concerns and if you have any possible solutions we welcome those too. Um, with regards to the charter schools, uh, some good news is that the current law for uh, the virtual charter schools, there is a maximum cap on how many students can enroll in these charter schools. So um, at least at this round, I mean, it still, it still would have a definite impact on our schools in, in, in losing those monies to, to the virtual, um, virtual charters. But it's not as bad as it has been for other states. <coughs> and um, I would say that we as a committee are also, at least there are, I, I believe there are um, a majority of members of the committee who believe that it's important to engage in the exercise about what are the real costs to providing virtual education and reflecting the state's allocation based on that and not just assuming that the state average for brick and mortar student costs should automatically be transferred to the um, virtual charter schools. And um, there actually has been some research on how to create a model to do that. Uh, we had the public hearing um, the earlier this week and um, we will be working on that over the next couple of weeks also. And um, would rec you know, welcome your comments and suggestions also. But, I do think that to be responsible with taxpayer money, you have to ask the question, how much is the real cost and what is it that the state believes is appropriate to provide based on that? Um, some would characterize that as trying to cut off the, the needs of the charge schools. I just look at it as good business. Um, I, don't, I can't imagine any business not in trying to cost out its um, elements and figuring out what, what, what the, the break-even point is. So that's what we are going to be doing also. Want to know what your return on your investment is? That's right. <laughs> absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. Anyone else? Questions? Comments? Again, thank you both yeah, for for being for here. We we so appreciate it, and and we certainly will be reaching out to you and having these conversations. Best of luck to you folks. Mm -hmm. It's hard all around. I know. So um, please let me know if there's anything, any information that you need from us, and if something develops. Um, we'll try to get that information out as quickly as possible.
Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Nice Thank to you. see you Good night. Good to see you. on the 24th of March. Uh, I've told the girls that, that I will give them details and they will probably be in touch because we're hoping that they will be able to join us and Come in. meet yeah. with you and, sure. and, and Amy and they're doing a great job for us. It's a great program. Wonderful. Thank you for coming. Happy to have, happy to have anyone come and shadow us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Good to see you again. And we have our next uh, piece of the evening, and that would be our 5.2, and that would be an update on our FY 2015 budget development. And I will turn that over to Dr. Entwistle, I believe, for a, an introduction. That's right. Um, I plan to just give you a, a brief uh, uh, update, really, in terms of the in terms of the school budget. Um, Kate and the school leaders over these uh, last several weeks have been meeting uh, to really um, pull together the numbers that are needed for the level services budget. Um, uh, things like bargained increases in uh, existing employee wages, projected increase in in benefit costs. Um, increase in terms of uh, what's projected for energy and supplies, of course, are all um, uh, projected and factored into this budget level. So um, level services, just so that we're clear, uh, some people refer to it as a status quo budget, is really projecting what will it take to continue doing exactly what we're doing this year, next year, um, and including in that the incremental changes um, that are basically already built in for us. In terms of um, new proposal, uh, the school leaders um, are right on top of that in terms of looking at the additional resources that they need to advance each of the uh, phases that they have responsibility for, um, advancing uh, programming options for kids, um, advancing new initiatives uh, to really uh, drive a, a higher quality educational experience for, um, for our students. Uh, not surprisingly, um, there continues to be significant and uh, very legitimate resource needs uh, that are reflected in these new proposals and uh, also not surprisingly those needs carry with them a correspondingly significant price tag. Um, and um, the tough a job uh, that we are engaged in as a leadership council is uh, taking all of the priorities because they are priorities and then figuring out what are the really top priorities. Um, and it's, um, uh, it's work that uh, gets a little stressful, um, but I'm pleased to say that um, I have a, a, a team that is uh, very energized by that and fortunately very good natured. Um, as, and they handle stress well. <laughs> um, yes, I think that I think that we collectively handle stress um, very well. And, it, and but it is getting a little edgy right now because um, <laughs> because I'm asking them to really think um, I in some different ways uh, that we would prefer, quite frankly, not to be thinking. And but um, but we we need to be prepared. Um, the next one. So then, uh, what we have really is. Um, and, and the language that you're used to is the student needs based budget. It's our obligation and responsibility to report to the school board um, what would really be needed in order to continue to fund and support best practices uh, towards uh, becoming uh, the, the uh, or achieving that higher performing level that we're really looking at. So the student needs based budget basically takes level services. What we're doing now what that would cost to do next year with the incremental costs and looking at the new proposals. And again, the outcome being um, the best in terms of student learning. Um, and then number four, you see, and again, some of this is old hat to some of you, but school leaders recognize that the student needs-based budget 
um, while um, accurately pr pr projecting student need and, uh, and what we really need to stay on a positive tra trajectory, we also recognize that it may not be fully achievable without placing a significant burden on community resources. So as a result, we have what we call the essential level services budget. And uh, this is um, uh, the budget that's presented to the, the, the school board um, and it represents uh, reduced requests. Um, uh, it's, it is a slowing of the trajectory of improvement um, and really trying to balance and figure out what are the mission critical needs that we have um, and, uh, and, and trying to include those in that um, uh, level uh, services budget. So we're hard at work. Um, we, the good news is we're making good progress. Uh, good news is that everyone's still talking to each other. Um, and, um, and, uh, and again, uh, the team is, as far, as far as I'm concerned, is right on track in terms of identifying the needs that really are essential, the needs that are, are, um, are really the resources that are required in order to move us to that, to that next level. So the next steps. Uh, we have Kate, uh, our Director of Business and Finance, uh, finalizing uh, the level services budget. Again, some of those numbers in there will still be projections. We do not know what the benefit uh, increases will be. Um, we have to carry that basically, as you know, until we get more towards the 11th hour of the budget. Um, the Leadership Council does continue to review and, and truly prioritize um, all of the new proposals. Um, as you know, each of those new proposals um, uh, comes uh, with a, um, there's a very specific protocol that's followed for any new proposal in terms of cost, um, implications, connection with the 18-month improvement plan, um, uh, uh, looking at um, alternative uh, ways uh, to fund um, or achieve uh, s uh, some of that new proposal and so on. So it's, uh, there, it, it truly is in a proposal format and those, of course, um, the ones that we will bring forward to the board or the ones that we won't be bringing forward to the board um, are available for you all to uh, review and we'll uh, have those available to you on um, either in advance of or certainly uh, by the time we have our, our Saturday workshop. Um, we are scheduled to provide a school board finance, um, uh, 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 an update in terms of where we are on the budget. Uh, in terms of that level services piece to the school board at the Finance Budget Committee next Thursday, which is the 6th. So we have uh, the, the pleasure of meeting not only this week, but we're meeting next week as well. Um, and the superintendent will present um, the Leadership uh, Council's essential level services uh, budget to the full board on March 20th. So that, that's kind of where we are. Um, we're, we're starting to get to some numbers, uh, starting to, to see some things, and certainly on the 6th uh, we will have um, more details and um, absolutely by the 20th when I present the Leadership Council's budget um, we will be projecting um, that essential level services um, uh, number. Any questions? Questions, anyone? Don't see any Seeing questions. None. Seeing none, I think we'll move on then. Um, 5.3, discussion about our improvement efforts. This is a progress update on our 18-month improvement plan, and I will turn it again back over to Dr. Edwards. Right, and uh, Monique is bringing up this presentation, and uh, I actually, um, you'll be pleased to know that I actually share the responsibility for presenting this with some of my other colleagues. Um, this is um, a progress report on school improvement. Uh, we do this on a very regular basis. Um, it's very difficult to keep that 18-month, uh, now this second 18-month improvement plan um, in, a, in one scope and really uh, do it justice in a short period of time. Uh, this is um, a, f a focus uh, on our improvement efforts um, from a, an organizational perspective. Um, uh, our improvement plan, the, eight, the first one and now the second 18-month improvement plan um, is, is really not just a checklist of <coughs> improvement items like you do this, done, this, done, um, but it really, uh, the, the plan itself creates um, uh, systems and structural changes that are happening over time. 
And um, you may be surprised to know that we are in our 27th month of, a, you know, this is now our second 18-month plan. We're in the 27th month of a, basically a three-year plan. Um, each phase, um, uh, K2, um, 3-5, middle school and high school, um, has had a plan from the uh, inception of the first 18-month improvement uh, uh, effort, and they continue executing that, um, and they continue to, as well, refine uh, their plan. The purpose of the plan is, is truly to transform their organizations to support what we need to do in terms of, um, to, uh, of achieving the level of, of both student and teacher growth. Um, so this report is really through the lens of our organizational structure. If you, um, my, in my overview, um, as I often do, I, I always uh, spill the beans ahead of time. We are in the 27th <laughs> month of our 36 month plan. Um, I think the important piece to understand here is this work is now being sustained into a third year. So what seemed like oh, 18 months, year and a half, what happens with these 18 month plans is as they link together, we move to three years and, and four and a half and six and, 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 and keep um, uh, essentially building a, on, a, on a longer term strategic plan. Um, uh, in each phase, uh, there, uh, we've been pleased uh, through the, this period of time, the 27 months that we've been working on this, that there have been incremental and targeted investments. Um, but it's important to understand that those investments have been coupled with extraordinary leadership on the part of uh, the school leaders, um, uh, the, the, the folks in the central office who are uh, providing support to our school leaders in the schools, the folks in the schools providing the leadership um, and, as, and essentially as well their faculty members. So um, the investments I would say are instrumental, those targeted investments that we're making, um, small though they are, they're being targeted in the right ways, we're getting some good results, um, but don't underestimate um, that the uh, leadership um, and the effort at the school level that is absolutely essential to making these uh, changes and, and making this progress. Um, the coordination of the efforts, I think, has have certainly been guided by uh, that clear and sustained and shared vision that comes from this now, our second 18-month plan. Um, and I'm, I couldn't be any more pleased to say that our team has maintained a laser-like focus um, on our plan, the overall district plan, their, their specific piece of it, um, and on the vision that's created by that plan. Um, and as a result, the good news is uh, progress does continue to be made. Um, the business uh, uh, talk about it is that we are, maximizing, we are maximizing resource utilization and the impact of those resources. Um, as Senator Millett was talking, um, I, I couldn't be any more pleased to hear what she was saying because um, uh, essentially that is the plan of action that we've adopted, for example, around uh, professional development. It is the best way to maximize the limited resources that we have. Um, uh, and the impact, uh, uh, when we talk about impact, we're really talking about creating equal access for all students. We're talking about, um, particularly from, from an organizational perspective now, looking at scheduling that allows flexibility um, and a level of school responsiveness to the needs that we uh, continue to see changing um, week to week and certainly year to year. So uh, the other piece of the good news, just in general, is in terms of the 18-month plan or the 27-month out of the 36-month plan is that we are um, seeing absolute uh, evidence of improving the quality of teaching and learning, which, as you know, is goal one. Monique? Was that my transition? No, yeah, that was it. <laughs> <laughs>
um, bringing in the engaged citizenship piece, and certainly in terms of resources and communication in order to make all one uh, move forward. Uh, and as you recall, uh, we've had a couple presentations with the board this year in and around uh, the Common Core, uh, and what does that mean, and um, we talked a little bit about what that means is college and career readiness. That's our focus for our students. Those are our accounts for college and career readiness. We also talked a little bit about this proficiency-based, standards-based learning, all that educational jargon and what that means for us, and moved to that proficiency-based diploma. We talked a little bit about the uh, student-centered learning, and that's where our focuses are in terms of our decision making, in terms of all of our actions moving towards this 18 month inclusion strategy. And so what does that mean, just a refresher? That really means that what we're focused on and the decisions and the improvements we make <coughs> are really focused on enhancing student learning. We're not making decisions for organizational convenience or for organizational equilibrium the status quo. It's really about what is going to help students learn more or better. And that is our focus there. So it really is about teaching and learning. It really is around making some steady and positive growth in those areas. Uh, focusing on that plan. It's really about becoming more student-centered in the learning pieces. And what we're finding is we can only go so far before we really have to look at things systemically. And that's where the organizational focus comes into play. Uh, there are some examples, like our PLTs, as Dr. Angelis has talked about, but we really can only go so far. So this continued progress really needs continued incremental investments, but it also means organizational shifts, some changes that will enable students and teachers to learn more about it. And again, our mission is to prepare our students for the future, and our organizational structures need to maximize their flexibility in order that we can provide that learning environment that will engage all students and prepare them for that college and career readiness. So what do those organizational shifts enable us to do? Well, if we really are preparing for the future, they're going to enable us to provide more equal access, that student-centered learning, and key piece is learning for every student, for all students. Sometimes our organizational structures, as uh, you've heard at this meeting, sometimes it works for some students, and there are hurdles or barriers for other students. So we're really looking at making some shifts so that we can enable all students um, to be learning at high levels of rigor. Secondly, more efficient and effective utilization of our limited resources. We're not assuming in the future there are going to be more resources, so we certainly want to maximize what we have and we want to make sure that we're making the best use of those funds. And lastly, more relevance in student learning. As you folks know and as you folks have heard, we talk about the four C's and the 21st century skills necessary for students uh, to deal with that future which is unknown. We want to make sure that we're moving away from learning the content to more rigorous applying the content to the learning. So what does that look like K-12 organizationally? Where are we K-12? You'll notice on the left, we've got primary through high school. Uh, you'll notice also that primary and high school are in similar spots. Bringing students in, transitioning students in, and transitioning students out is a complex business. Uh, those folks are in the process of exploring systems, structures, and programs. Uh, in the middle, intermediate and uh, the middle phase levels, uh, those folks are ready to shift their organizational designs a bit. They have been involved in looking at high-performing schools, looking at their practices, their organizational structures, and they're ready to start making some shifts. What I'd like to do is illustrate a little bit the specifics around primary and high school for you. For example, at primary, in their explorations, they've been focusing on some data-driven curriculum choices. They've been using the data for children's progress, an assessment piece which gives teachers some immediate feedback on where students are so they can plan for their instruction. They've been focused on striking their kindergarten entry and onboarding. That's a business term in the educational world that's called transitioning students into school. And the Jumpstart program that Dr. Entwistle mentioned earlier is part of that. Uh, they're piloting trimesters and they're looking to adopt student-led conferences. And again, you'll, you'll find this theme of student-centered learning in all of these examples. And would you like to add any additional detail or anything you're excited about as primary or on this end? <coughs> well, I think the, one of the most exciting things for us is to talk about a little bit already tonight, which is that early childhood piece. And Dr. Engelsel mentioned the Jumpstart program.
program already, but uh, one of the exciting things about it is that since we've been able to train so many teachers in this Jumpstart curriculum, they have now brought it to their classrooms, and we have different teachers applying it in different ways. We have one school who uh, spent the first month of September recreating a mini Jumpstart program with small group of students who didn't register early enough in the spring to be considered for the program over the summer. We have a lot of students who don't register until August, and then you know they come in and they're not quite ready. So we were able to identify them and, and program for them for the month of September and give them this jump, this boost, this really intense literacy immersion, and then send them back to their regular classrooms full time, and they were that much further ahead. Um, another teacher at my school um, did a mini version of that, and instead of having the 15 to 2 ratio, she just had her 1 to 20, but she incorporated many of the activities in the first month of school, doing a letter a day, doing all of the different um, immersion activities, and so she has data for her students and to how that will, um, how that grew her students more quickly, and hopefully how that growth will sustain itself throughout the year. So um, we're just really excited to offer those programs and have that program to lead into the rest of the school year and really enhance the teaching and the learning throughout the whole, the whole kindergarten grade level and, and first and second grade teachers for that matter too are getting training and, and enjoying the activities. Thank you. And from kindergarten on up through high school, uh, David has been involved um, this year at building a cycle of decision making at the high school which has contributed greatly to the high school being able to launch into many of these um, explorations around systems and structures and programs, specifically advancing the technology usage and you'll see a proposal in CIP for the one to one initiative coming forward. But also exploring student centered scheduling and we chatted at this table around the barriers of the high school schedule. Uh, so they're involved in exploring those pieces. They're reassessing their graduation requirements, as we've discussed at this table as well. And looking to develop multiple learning pathways for students so that there are more choices for students to pursue their interests. And uh, lastly, design and implement that proficiency-based learning experience for students, but also that diploma uh, as well. David, would you like to highlight on any of what I've mentioned? Uh. Well, I'll just add to that that I think an important discussion that we've had is that when you do tackle all the things that you're, you know, we're investing time and energy into, a lot of it has to do with the culture and climate of the school. And we work very hard. You know, when you examine these things one-to-one -one and changing the schedule and, and all these other things, that's, that's a change agent. And it's significant for a lot of educators. So we work very hard on the part that Monique mentioned earlier, and that's the culture and climate is making a shift into being open to discuss these things and examine our current practices and what is best for students and is it student-centered. And so that's something that we're trying to put in place first. So as we tackle these tougher issues, we have the professional mentality to, to approach those things. And I think that's key to any of the work we're going to do. At the intermediate level, the intermediate and the middle schools are poised to be in shifting through organizational designs. Uh, specifically, uh, at the intermediate level, we're looking to establish learning communities, whereas in the past we've organized our students geographically uh, in terms of uh, neighborhoods or wings. And we're moving towards learning communities, which infuses the function or the purpose, which is learning, as opposed to geography. We're going to be looking to implement a new teaming structure. Uh, we're going to be, going to be looking to minimize the impact, maximize, <laughs> excuse me, the impact <laughs> of um, With the new building. Uh, and the new building is coming down the pike rather soon. All is going well. And it's a perfect opportunity to um, make some of these uh, design changes. Uh, we're looking to accelerate project based learning. That's where students will be applying the content in real life relevant um, experiences, learning experiences. Also, to explore the notion of trimesters. The K2s have been piloting trimesters and in the process they're going to be gathering data on that. Two phase levels are going to be working quite closely together to see how the trimester reporting piece might contribute to better, better quality communication with parents. 
Hey, Mary, would you like to? Uh, just, uh, just I'm to sure you can go on and on. I have a little something to say. <laughs> um, obviously, we have a state of the art facility that we are about to go into. And the importance there is not to simply bring the old Wentworth into this new facility, but to take advantage of the many opportunities that the new facility will provide us with, from structural ones to certainly the technologies and the opportunities to rethink. And I use the term, we're not going to create a new Wentworth, we're renewing our commitment to students and our commitment to the, the kind of work uh, that we have been working toward, but not being able to solidify as a 100% opportunity, and this new facility provides that for us. Similarly, at the, at the middle school, the middle school will be establishing learning communities. They'll be implementing a new teaming structure as well, accelerating the project-based learning, maximizing the impact of the new technologies that they have in place now. But they're also working on their schedule and reducing, looking to reduce those scheduling barriers. Uh, and strengthen their connections program as well. Um, Barbara, would you like to share a little bit? So we've been very busy and very excited about our work. We've spent a lot of time looking at high performing schools um, in the surrounding area as well as out of state. And um, working with the teachers, we have um, planned um, a, more opportunities for teachers to become experts in their field and to have time to work within the day to support each other and support their students. So we're very excited about uh, the plans that we have in place and with a real focus on, a refocus on middle school practice. What I'd like to do is get a little bit of depth here in terms of the learning communities notion. You see the Weber School um, and then there's a graphic below in the middle school with a graphic below. <coughs> And uh, at the Wentworth School, the lunar communities uh, will consist of cross-grade level groupings. At the middle school, single-grade groupings. And the reason why is because of the students uh, in their uh, research uh, with high-performing schools and taking over schools, uh, both in state and out of state, they found that this structure works best for students. And so each will contain smaller inquiry teams of all three grade levels. So at Wentworth School, that graphic is one learning community. There will be smaller teams of a classroom of grade three students, a classroom of grade four students, a classroom of grade five students. There will also be an inquiry team of a blended a classroom of students who are in grades three and grades four. And there will be one classroom, another one, and then a fifth grade. Now, at the Weber School, the students will be in the same learning community for all three years. And the same group of students with the same group of teachers for all three years. At the middle school, the learning communities will consist of single grade level, a sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade groupings. But each will contain smaller inquiry teams as well. So there'll be a math, ELA, science, social studies sixth grade inquiry team. There'll be three of those on a team. Students will move from one learning team, one excuse me, not will move from one learning community um, to another each year as they progress through the middle school. And all students will participate in the connections where they have a one teacher that they have a relationship with over the course of all three years as well. So looking at it from a school perspective, uh, at the Wentworth School, there'll be four of these learning communities. At the middle school, there'll be three of these learning communities which cross the, run across the grade level. In terms of outcomes, I'm going to move your uh, attention down to the staff area because really what this, these shifts allow us to do and allow the staff to do is to be able to do more for students. It allows them to design those student-centered learning environments to best meet their needs and pursue their interests. So they'll have dedicated planning time to customize the learning. They'll also have grade level and cross grade level collaboration to enhance lesson and instructional design. They'll be learning from each other. So that the students will be involved in authentic, integrated, hands-on project-based experiences that promote those 21st century skills. Cross grade level student collaboration and 
Student leadership development, students will have the opportunity because they'll be have cross grade level student collaborative activities. They'll have the opportunity to also develop leadership skills which we know are important assets as students move on. The scheduling flexibility um, will allow us to better meet individual needs and we're looking to have greater student ownership of their learning as well as part of this process. And in terms of assessing these changes and how well they're working, I'm going to turn that back over to Dr. Whistle. I think, um, I think there's uh, three key factors that we need to look at in any kind of um, improvement effort. We've got to make sure that the investment of time, the in investment of effort, and the investment of resources is um, being demonstrated in terms of student performance data. Um, seriously, what we're looking at is breaking through the plateaus. I think uh, last year, uh, around this time, and will be happening again in March, we'll take a look at student data and uh, what is happening at each of the phase levels. Um, the, the positive news is that we see um, a, a positive uh, gain in student learning, but quite frankly, overall, when we look across student groups, we see plateaus. We see that we are not really making big breaks from sort of the status quo. So key one is we will look at student performance data and the question that I want to know and I'm sure the question that each of the school leaders wants to know is are we breaking through these plateaus? Um, secondly, and it's been mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, um, what do we look like when we benchmark ourselves with other schools, like schools, and higher performing schools? What do we look like? What do they look like? Um, and what we're expecting to see is that we are moving towards um, the, the same uh, benchmarks that those higher performing schools have. Um, and third is we will continue to assess our systems, our best practices, and our program quality, which is pretty much what is ongoing right now. So that's the third key. I think that in terms of uh, any uh, implementation, as we go through a longer period of time in terms of an improvement focus. Uh, communication um, is essential and it's essential that that be effective. Um, it's critically important that teachers are um, involved and engaged and we've heard the importance of uh, professional development um, as our uh, senator was, was speaking about that. I think you probably already have a pretty clear idea that we've committed significant effort and resources, at least certainly resources in terms of time, uh, to professional development and, um, and ensuring that our teachers are growing uh, to, really, to really make that push. And the third is, is, is really what uh, is done with any plan, which is continuous reflection, evaluation, recalibration, refocusing, essentially making adjustments if we're not getting the kind of results that we're really looking for. Yeah. It sort of starts with, I'm sort of the book. Okay. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so you began it and now you just wrapped it up. Right. Okay. Do we have any questions? Jackie's waving over there. I, did, I didn't see, can you back up to the previous slide, please? No, the one, yes, that one. Uh, where there can be cross-pollination is the word that comes, the phrase that comes to mind, but uh, the ability of a, uh, of a student who's uh, a grade six, so to speak, or a grade three who is, is able to be challenged by something of a higher grade. How, how is that accomplished? Do you want me to share it? Yeah. All right, so at the middle school, because of this new reorganization, there will be a math class offered every single period so that it's easier to schedule a student um, off an inquiry team or off a learning community um, than it is now. We're also going to be offering in our schedule a, um, a day, once a five-day rotation, it looks like now, where students will have an opportunity for extra support, time to 
um, make up tests, quizzes, but also for acceleration, um, focusing on something that they want um, that they want to learn. Um, so that will be built into the schedule for those students. And so you feel that, that what you're looking for for next year is more flexible yes. with student learning than what we're currently engaged in? Absolutely. That was the goal in the redesigns, is the flexibility, is to maximize the flexibility that these students need. So it really kind of turns into, just to ask a question, like sort of like a high school schedule where you have the opportunity to be able to, depending on where you fall in that math group, to be able to put that student not necessarily with like a typical homeroom teacher, but with a teacher that suits that needs. Yeah, it's somewhat similar, okay. but in the, in the high school schedule, if you have those sections available, you they're crafting their schedule in order to try to make that happen. Okay. So generally, the students will stay on that inquiry team, yeah. right? And those four teachers will be very involved with those that group of 80 to 100 students. Eighth grade, we know we have um, stu uh, leveling of math, so this will be easier for them to move between. But you know, we also do have students where we might need to meet their needs at a different grade level. This will offer them that opportunity. So I suggest that when you present this to parents, that you dumb it down like you just did for me. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, uh, I didn't get it. No, that's good, yeah. Jackie. I did not get it when, when it was presented, and I'm trying to figure out how is this better. Mm -hmm. So you've just explained to me how it is better, and parents will need to know that. And I guess I'm on the Jackie train, too, because I don't have kids that are old enough yet, so I haven't experienced the middle school. What is it currently... How has this, what is the switch? All right, so we are now um, organized vertically with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders on each wing. Now we're going to be organized in horizontal learning communities. So students will be together by grade level, all students. Does, does that make sense? Starting, yeah. okay. in, starting in September, it's going to be, um, you have several teams, so you have one team to six graders. In yes, the whole one learning team. Yes. Just yes. for practical purposes, so students who are already at the middle school will get reshuffled. Yes. In the fall. Yes, and every year they'll be reshuffled. That is why um, it is so important that we keep connections with one teacher for three years. And I think that. When we think about our work together and we think about how we transition children face to face, uh, one, of the, one of the key elements for us is our children are younger, obviously, a little more dependent in terms of their learning style, but we felt it was critical to be supporting uh, the concept of children learning from children and uh, offering all those wonderful characteristics that we talked about earlier, the, you know, in terms of cross-grade collaboration mm -hmm. and student leadership. And we can't do that without some flexibility. So for us, making this kind of a pattern offers our third graders to work with fourth graders, our fifth grade staff to work with our third graders. Mm -hmm. It will offer challenges of students being able, while in a discrete grade, to also be able to have those opportunities to work together in that project-based learning model. Mm -hmm. So we're looking as if we are preparing students to come into this fuller circle where they're really more able to do that content focus and so build. I have another question. So a teacher, say, at the middle school currently that teaches, and I'll just say, sixth grade, typically they would teach math and, and science. science. Okay, so in this new model, will that teacher still do that, or will that teacher make a shift into one or the other and then have six, I don't know how many periods you have a day, but just saying. Well, we say have, have eight periods. now. It looks like we will have six periods. Okay, so throughout that six periods, then that teacher is going to have, say, five math classes. Four math classes. Okay, four math classes, and then they have their duty or their lunch period or their set work session or their IEP meetings or whatever it might mm -hmm. possibly be. Okay, all right, makes sense. So have you already, I guess, um, the, there has to be a buy-in, obviously, on the teacher end of it. Well, because teachers have been working with me for two years, 
there's a lot of buy-in there. Okay. All right. Okay. And they've been pushing me. They wanted to do this last year. Okay. We're not ready. <laughs> I know. I know. There's been talk about it for quite yeah. some time. So I know that it doesn't happen by snapping your fingers overnight. So um, I think it's a good shift. Jane, question? Yes, I want to ask you how much uh, flexibility are we going to give students like each, if some student is uh, more advanced in, you know, ERA and are we going to give them that, you know, say you can go to the next level class, that kind of flexibility to so give them more challenge. I think a lot of the uh, we hear is, you know, is the kids need to be challenged and, you know, some are certainly not everybody is like that, but we hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. So were we able to give that, you know, satisfy the needs in that way, give them that flexibility? Well, now that we have, we will have the flexibility that will be able to happen. Will be happy. But the other thing that will happen is if a teacher is really able to focus on one content like math, mm -hmm. which is very, our new program, like yours, is very time consuming, very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, if a teacher really gets to focus at middle school on that one content, they're going to be able to do a better job differentiating for students at both ends of the spectrum. So I think we're going to see a difference there also. Okay. okay. Thank you. Just a follow up to that. Um, so this year was kind of a shift in the Gates delivery in the mm -hmm. middle school level. What will it look like next year with this? Can I talk to that, Allison? Sure. We just met yesterday. Yeah, we just met. This is, it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. it, it opens up a lot of doors and um, kind of the unexpected opportunity we had this year, we, the, the challenges of the schedule forced us to look at some other uh, models and uh, specifically a push-in model and co-teach model and there's been a very positive response from the students and from the staff on the benefits of that. So we're looking at kind of four different potential models next year. One is a grade level acceleration for math. The other is a push-in model for language arts, a co-teach model for language arts, and also creating a, a seminar, a monthly co-taught seminar for all of the gifted, uh, identified gifted students to be together to have that opportunity um, to work with each other. Um, so we saw it as an opportunity to balance their social emotional as well as cognitive critical thinking skills with these different opportunities that this schedule is going to afford us. Yeah, it's great. So I have friends of Jane. Yeah, a little more question. You guys have been had some kind of pilot program given grades in terms of one to four um, in the EOA curriculum. Yes. Is that something going to be continuing? Yeah. So how does a kid going to, you know, look at that grade, it's hard to see where exactly this kid is, you know, in middle school. Is that going to be just for year A or for cross board? Eventually it will be the entire, my school as well as the high school, as Wentworth, we'll all be moving to that type of reporting. So how does the GPA, you know, will our GPA from our school compared to other <laughs> there, you know, this there, are, there are many school districts moving towards that. It, it may not necessarily be a four-point scale, maybe an eight-point scale, but the, the idea behind that is, and this is the flexibility piece, is that we have s curriculum goals, and as students meet those goals, and that's what the reporting is, is whether or not they meet those goals. If they meet those goals, and that's why we're building these flexible scheduling, so that students can then go on to the next set of curriculum goals, as opposed to a percentage number. So there are different ways of figuring out GPA under that system. One of the things that we've been doing at the high school level is collaborating with other high schools who are using these systems or dual systems uh, to figure out how to calculate either a GPA or how colleges will receive students' transcripts and information. Colleges are very good at figuring out and receiving wide ranges of student transcripts. Homeschool students who do not have a GPA mm -hmm. have a better entrance <laughs> success rate than students who come from high school. So GPA, colleges look at a range of data on students in terms of that application. So if a student doesn't have a GPA or we don't send students off with a, G, a GPA, it doesn't mean that they're not going to get into college. So 
what we're one of the pieces in that exploring systems and structures is what does our transcript what will it look like in that way so that it's not ten pages of lots and lots of stories and you know numbers but it articulates what students need to know I, I've said this over and over again it's my vision is that our students graduate from Scarborough High School not with a transcript but with a resume with something that describes the real life experiences that they have had um, that authentic relevant experiences so we know they're well on their way well prepared to be college and career ready interesting just a point to the GPA piece um, I've just gone through the whole college situation I have a senior at the high school and they recalculated at every university she applied Absolutely. to how the GPA came out and and at what percentage and this and that and I said how could six schools each say a different thing about that number that came to them from Scarborough but they based different things one of the schools if she took a level four class gave an extra point for this and if you just took a standard level three class, you got a point for that, and you got two points for something else. And I thought, okay, that was pretty interesting. So it it does happen, and it it worked. So thanks for she's going to school. Me. She's going on to school anyway. <laughs> yeah. So anybody else? Donna. So um, a little while ago, you mentioned um, the value of kids staying with the same teacher. Um, were you re referring to the to the homeroom? No, the C connections is an advisory program. Okay, okay. They meet weekly. Okay, okay. So that'd be once a week, and those kids would be with that advisor for three, three years. years. Yes. But that would that would be the only person who Correct. remains the same in, with this plan. Correct. So will there be a homeroom actually? Or I'm not sure yet how they will. Uh, we're working on that. I need a longer day. <laughs> Gee, we'd love to give you that. <laughs> Not sure how everybody else feels about a longer day, but <laughs> today's a pretty long day. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Question? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So much. Very nice presentation. Very We're very excited to see how this all comes out. Um Let's see. Oh, 5.4, upcoming dates of importance. And since I don't have any, I'll turn it over to Dr. <laughs> Entwistle because he must have some. Um, I was just thinking that it, we could, I, I know that one of them that I presented is the uh, March 20th, which is the role of, of the Leadership okay. Council budget. Um, you all have the budget calendar uh, because uh, shortly thereafter, um, in, in April, we'll be doing our seven-day workshop. I wasn't sure if there were other okay. dates that were important sure. to the to your team, yes. Christine. That yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. Sorry, okay. I, I had to pull I it up here. You tried to push that one off on me, but no. <laughs> well, no. okay. So um, again, we've got the budget development going on. So um, we have some presentations coming up. So it's important. Uh, we have a meeting Thursday, March 20th. Of course, at 7 p.m., that's the superintendent's first presentation of the budget. Wednesday, April 16th at 7 p.m. is the town council public hearing on the school and municipal budget. So it's extremely important uh, to be there, to attend, to tell all those folks that wish to speak. This is one of their opportunities. Um, it's probably one of the best, but um, there will be another as well. And that, um, that's the town council meeting that's that we the attend. the 16th. It's yeah. Wednesday, April 16th okay. at 7 p.m. So, yep. <clears throat> so um, that's the meeting. And then Thursday, May 1st at 7 p.m., we, as the school board, have our second reading and our vote on the FY 2015 budget. Um, and then the council the following week, Wednesday, May 7th, they will have their second reading and they will vote on the full municipal budget for 2015. So that's the other opportunity where people would be able to come and speak. And that would be typically right at the beginning of that meeting where they do their little half an hour kind of 
give us your best shot right before we're going to make our decision. So um, I know that last year that was uh, a well attended uh, evening. So um, the 16th and the 7th, um, and then we have the validation vote, which would be May 13th, uh, which is Tuesday. So those are like the highlights. We do have more, of course, for those of you that are interested. It's a three-page document, I believe, uh, on the school website that will show every date, whereas, I mean, it'll show like all the leadership meetings and everything mm -hmm. else, and it'll give you what's happening. Mm -hmm. So did anybody have any questions about those dates that I provided? I had Jackie. written down for May 1st, the Sebago Alliance. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. Let see. I have May 1st, 5 p.m. We'll have a finance committee meeting first because we'll be discussing that um, to just finalize any last minute things. And then I've got the school board regular. That's our regular meeting. Thursday the 1st of May. So I don't, I don't know why I had written Sebago Alliance down. I just thought I'd ask. Potentially there could have been That's something right. else. I'm not looking at the original. That was also, I have a good um, drum and whistle school law. Uh, right, I have that down. Yeah. Uh, that would bring up another question. I've, I've received several that have said that they'd like to attend that May 1st session. I believe I have Donna, Jane, and Chris. Was there? Oh, I sent you an email on that. Okay, I'll look back through my email. Did you want to go? Yes. Okay. And I talked to Kelly. Mm -hmm. You did. Okay. I've been having trouble with my email, my replies. It said I had seven drafts, and I went back and I'm trying to figure out. I found two of them. Okay. I'll take a look back. I'm sorry if your name was overlooked. That was why I sent back out an email yesterday saying. Anybody, you know, wishing to go, just let me know. So. Uh, another day, and I just uh, uh -oh. I just found it is uh, March 20th, which is the um, I believe it's March 20th, right? Yeah, uh, that's your. Uh, the. Um, oh, that's our workshop too. At it's four o'clock. Right, it's the workshop with uh, MSMA. Right. Okay. And Starting at March 24th month. is is the the uh, school board stay at the health state house. Yes. And that's what you were referencing to when you were talking about the girls? Correct. Yes. Okay. As soon as I, I told the girls as soon as I get the schedule, I'll give it to them and they can perhaps make arrangements to meet with Mrs. Shirakri and Mrs. Volk. It's my understanding that that's starting at about 10 o'clock from what I understood again. I, 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 thought, it was, so, yeah. I thought it was going to be earlier than that starting, but the last thing I read was that it was going to begin at 10. So I think it's 10 o'clock. We won't have to leave as early as we thought. Very similar. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else this evening? Those, I think it was just Did good to make, sh make sure that we just kind of checked on some of those dates. Well, you'll so keep that. hearing these dates over and over again. So if, if you feel as though I'm harassing you with an email reminder or something, just tell me to lay off. So, um, Anything else? Um, I would just like to say that uh, we had Operation Cupid just before Valentine's Day. And the children of this community uh, made over 2,000 Valentines that went to the Veterans Home, that went to the Hewitt Center for Homeless Veterans in Saco. They were mailed out to a list from the Libby Mitchell Center, Libby Mitchell American Legion Post, I should say. and. Uh, Two boxes were shipped overseas to troops from Maine who are deployed. And the night that we gathered, and Mrs. Hathorn was there for a little bit, and this is all from the Builders Club leadership, Builders Club from the middle school led by Tom Griffin, and then Mary Griffin who is at the Wentworth School has a group of K kids, and they were there. Well, unfortunately, the hockey team couldn't. Girls' hockey team couldn't be there because they were playing in a playoff game. That's fortunate. <laughs> but uh, parents came, and we invited parents to stay because we didn't have as many children, as many students. But it was uh, again a very successful evening. Uh, John Thurlow and, and Miriam Collins joined the group last year. 
and have been very good at, from the from Blue Point School, I should say. So, and we are getting responses from veterans and the veterans home uh, accolades for our students. You know, bring tears to your eyes. And it's just one item that our children participate in for this community is that is bringing accolades. I thought you should know about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think Mr. Thurlow actually participates as the representative across K2, the K2 right. effort, if I'm yep. correct. Yeah, all the schools can send. All the children right. contribute. And the Key Club at the high school uh, gets high schoolers involved, and so it's a, it's a big project, and everybody has a good time. You can stop by and decorate. We, we do have um, next Friday our first Council of Business and School Partners, which is uh, that effort of really um, bringing us together with folks um, generally in the, in the Scarborough area, although there are some, for example, we have the, um, the president of SMCC who has agreed to sit on the council with us. Um, and Jody, you're the school board rep to that, and we're all meeting for breakfast next Friday, and that's our organizational meeting. We've had um, in incredible positive response from um, the folks that we've invited. It's, it's, it's very exciting. Very, very exciting. All right. Great. Anything else? Seeing nothing else, the will of the board this evening? I would like to meet with the negotiations team for a minute. Okay. We can do that <laughs> after. Will we adjourn? Thank you. Second. Do I have a second? All in favor of adjourning the meeting? Six plus two. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>